we're going to talk about understanding and working with intrusive memories after trauma. Um, I'll talk first, then a case from Sophia. And what's really great is at the end, we'll have a chance to talk more and for questions with each other. Um, Erin has already explained this. I'm a psychologist who's also a researcher um, and really interested in how we can develop uh, treatments. And I very much enjoyed being in Odessa. I have very warm memories of that, um, including shoe shopping in 2018. Um, and the book that came from that meeting, uh, thank you to um, uh, Eric and Irina and Joseph for the organizers of these meetings, was this one um, in the NATO series about risk management of terrorism in GCS. Um, there are many other previous hot topic talks and another talk alongside this one in particular you might wish to watch, watch is the one by Professor Sibranji about an evidence base for psychosocial interventions in war conditions. And today, I'm not going to talk to you so much about the evidence base now, but the evidence base where we should be going for the future and to talk together about research and clinical ideas about managing situations where resources are lacking and where our evidence isn't enough. And that's why I want to talk in particular about the war trauma context in Ukraine and intrusive memories, understanding what this symptom is and some ideas about how to work with it. So let's really understand this symptom because understanding clinically always gives us the secret to the tools. So intrusive memories after traumatic events are recurrent, involuntary, and intrusive recollections. They usually occur during the day, but when they're the same thing again and again, they can also occur in nightmares. They are also the, the hallmark symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder in DSM-5, in our diagnostic manual, but they can occur before a patient has PTSD and are very common soon after trauma. For most people, they will go away, but for some people they may persist, and if they carry on, they can persist for years. So they're worth taking seriously. We now know that there is some evidence that this early symptom is also a precursor, an early step to later to psychopathology. So perhaps it gives us a target to help prevent worsening of symptoms more generally. And what's really interesting is whilst most of the time we think about intrusive memories in the context of post-traumatic stress, actually intrusive memories of trauma occur in many different disorders. They can occur in complicated grief, an intrusive memory to do with the dead person. They can occur in depression. For example, you can have intrusive memory of a very sad and emotionally situation that can help drive a depression. They can occur in psychosis. And of course, they occur in bipolar disorder where people can be particularly vulnerable to developing intrusive memories after emotional events. And in other disorders such as borderline personality disorder. So many of your patients or the people you work with may have this um, particular symptom. And if we give a, a fict uh, an example, for example, um, of a war situation, one person might report having three different types of intrusive memories, perhaps the particular sight and sound of a bomb blast, um, a sight, another memory of seeing soldiers, and another intrusive memory of a child. And why these moments? What are they of? Well, for that individual, they tend to be the worst moment or the hot spots in the memory. The moment you realize something terrible is about to happen, for example. People may commonly report three, four different memories, but in the most complex cases, we rarely see more than 12 different types of memories. And some people only have one. And the range is quite variable. And I think under war situations, it's really important that our normal measures may not be that useful um, because the maximum number that you can get on the DSM caps is approximately one a day. 
whereas people at the moment or people with repeated trauma can be experiencing um, more than one a day. So 10 a week, 15 a week, 20 a week, 30 a week. So we need to be aware that this is a, an increasing and fluctuating symptom for some people. Now, intrusive memories are also really interesting. They're not like normal memories that we recall when we want to. As they say, they pop into mind against our will. And the cue from these memories tends to be either internal cues, like the patient has the same uh, emotional state that they were at at the time the memory was encoded, or it could be perceptual cues more commonly in the environment. If we say it was a car crash, the car was with a red car, then the trigger for that uh, uh, memory could be anything red, even a red jumper. And by definition, intrusive memories are unwanted and occurring against somebody's will. But the feature I really want to talk to you about is the fact that they all are sensory memories. They pop up and they predominantly tend to be visual memories. So the sight of a bomb blast, the sight of a car, the sight of a doctor. Um, but they can also occur in other sensory modalities. So to bring about with that smells and sounds and touches. But this intrusive imagery based nature is really interesting because this is very different from as therapists when we're working with verbal thoughts or, or beliefs. So in sensory memories are stored in a different part of the brain, like the visual cortex is back here. So sensory memories are in a totally different brain, which is we, means that a lot of the time words can't touch them. Like we need to do other imaginal tasks or sensory things to work with images um, in whatever modality that might be. And as far as the brain's concerned, it's like having a mini experience, really replaying again. Um, and we now know from brain scanning studies that um, even let's take something neutral like an apple, uh, if you if you see a, a red apple or if you shut your eyes and you imagine the red apple, very similar areas in your brain will light up and the same for movement and for smell and for touch. So it really is like a, a real event happening again. And that helps us, um, our patients make sense of why even if this memory is half a second long, when it's in this bit, visual imagery type, it really can have a strong impact as if the real thing was happening again. And it makes a lot of sense why they're so upsetting and scary for some people. Our research has shown that these images have a really strong impact on emotion, more than words do. I think that's really interesting for us as clinicians. Um, and so even if they're brief, they're very powerful. And the other really important thing about imagery is it has a fast track to driving behavior, both um, behavior to do something or like disrupting uh, concentration, but in particularly avoidance behaviors. And it makes sense. You, um, people seek to avoid the cues that trigger the memory. So perceptual cues or anything else that's like or a reminder of things in the memory. And we know from cognitive behavior therapy that it becomes a vicious cycle where the intrusive memories produce avoidance and the avoidance keeps that memory going round and round. So to summarize where we are so far, intrusive memories of trauma occur across mental health disorders. They're very unusual because they're not like our verbal thoughts, they're sensory memories, so they're in a different part of our brain and feel real, bring more emotion, hijack attention and disrupt functioning. So now clinically, I want to think about the idea that sometimes rather than tackling lots of different things in disorder, it might be really useful to focus on one symptom at a time, particularly when one symptom is very powerful. And in fact, some of the uh, international guidelines on PTSD, for example, are saying that when other treatments aren't available, a single symptom approach can be useful. So how do we focus on this single symptom intrusive memories? Well, first of all, as clinicians, we need an ambition for a target. What are we going to do? And I guess the, a clear ambition is to try and stop intrusive memories from coming back to mind. So we're to reduce the number of times a memory pops back unwanted. And by doing this, 
it's going to help reduce the negative impact that they have in the patient's daily life. This slide is a piece of light relief, but in English we have an expression, which is there are many ways to crack open a nut. And that's very true. You could take a complicated way to open a nut. And if we look at the squirrel in the middle, he's very ambitious, but it's quite a, complicated to use this tool. And maybe some of our ways that we solve things in therapy are quite complicated. But in low resource situations, sometimes we can use much simpler ways to open something. And this, maybe this person could do it by themselves. And that's why we want to try and develop very simple interventions that are simple enough that someone can have it in their own hands. And um, Sophia will also talk about the future of digital tools that we empower someone. If we know the mechanism to open something or to change something, then how can we teach someone to do that very simply? On the notion of hot topics, I had to put this picture in because it looks like they've learned to crack the nut by putting it on a hot ring. Um, I haven't tried it at home, but it just shows that there's a lot of creativity to solve the same task. So what we mean here then in therapy is we need to choose our tool depending on the situation and resources. In the Ukraine, we have people we need to think about the situation resources, you will know those best, and also for those in host countries. We need to think about the resources available very soon after a new trauma in the golden hours that um, uh, Eric and colleagues have talked about, um, but also in the days and months after trauma. So first of all, in high resource situations, our traditional techniques in CBT for treating, for example, intrusive memories were things like exposure techniques. Those are the techniques that are part of, for example, trauma-focused CBT or EMDR, eye movement reprocessing, sorry, desensitization and reprocessing therapy. Very, very useful evidence-based techniques, but can be very complicated to deliver remotely or in an ongoing situation. Imagery rescripting is also a useful technique so we can change images uh, with. And in this, it's a technique where you take the image and try and change the end, the meaning or the outcome. It can be very well when therapist assisted. And I would warmly recommend both these techniques if one has the resources and ability to deliver them. Um, in situations where there are less resources available, we might want to think about simpler ways to crack that nut. Um, so, um, and also, sorry, I should have added that there are some treatments that are useful for people that we may find help uh, with treatments like PM plus, um, which Marit Sabrandi talked about in her earlier hot topic, although it doesn't treat imagery directly, um, these, these may help and that's a future area of research. For now, I, um, I wanted to take up the, the guidelines that have come up, for, for example, for people, forcibly displaced people in a host country. Um, and there, if treatments are available, again, um, it's trauma-focused CBT, including narrative exposure therapy, and EMDR that have been recommended, which can be very helpful for intrusive memories. But I want to note one thing here, and that is, A, it's dependent on resources, and B, it's dependent on the ability of the patient to discuss the traumatic event in detail. And what we also need to think about is situations where the resources aren't available or the patient may not want to talk about their event in detail. And there may be many reasons they won't want to talk about it, maybe distressing, maybe shaming, maybe complex, or by talking about it could make uh, a risk for dissociation, which if we were in our normal clinical practice, we could handle well, but if we're doing things by teleconference or working remotely, are much harder to manage. The patient may be in a situation where they're around others, for example, in a shelter, and not able to talk, want to talk, or simply want to keep what happened to them private. So what can we do in those situations? Well, one way we can work with intrusive memories is to think about metacognitive reappraisal. And that's why understanding these memories is so helpful. So to take away their power, it's very important to, to understand, to learn. An intrusive memory is simply mental imagery. It's just an image. It may seem real, but it's not real. Having an event in, a in your mind does not mean that you're going mad. 
and it does not mean that the event is happening again now. It's just your brain reacting again, trying to tell you that, but that's not actually the case. And this may sound very simple, but it's really always worth doing with patients. When we ran a bipolar clinic, the simple technique was one of the most powerful ones for helping people with bipolar, for example, who are very prone to intrusive memories of traumatic events and emotional events to understand that they didn't have to act on them and that they weren't real. People can learn something's not real, like an image by um, being reminded, for example, that words and images are very different in the brain. And also by doing, as it were, a behavioral experiment in their own imagination to check out that something isn't real. Now, as therapists, you'll have lots of good skills to do this. But if your patient felt something felt very real, you can do this in, in a number of ways without talking about the trauma. You can ask someone to change the color of a mental image. You can ask someone to change or shrink the size of a mental image. Children can be particularly good at this. You can ask them to, to experiment with pushing it away down a telescope. You can ask them to put in a, an object that's impossible in it, which says in the picture, I am not real, like put an elephant in it. So there are lots of ways that we can use creatively as clinicians that teach someone visually, this image in my mind of trauma is not a real thing happening now. And the other way to give people control is to give them a very simple way someone's to monitor and track that symptom, whether it's on their smartphone or on paper, just to check their occurrence and to notice again how it's triggered and how they can bring it back under control. And the final thing that I want to talk about, and that we'll spend a little bit more time on, is a new line of research that we've been working on developing to treat intrusive images after trauma that should be transdiagnostic. Um, and it should be useful both soon after a trauma and longer after. So to recap, before I get to this, we've talked about four techniques so far, exposure, rescripting, metacognitive appraisal, and imagery computing tasks. Let's talk a bit more about this. Again, as I said, this isn't in current clinical guidelines, it's at an early research stage, but may give us clinical ideas that go beyond the current evidence base and where resources are lacking. Now, this is the, the science bit that, that we need to understand to do this. There's a hypothesis and it brings three things together. Number one, intrusive memories after trauma are sensory images. Number two, our brains can't do two things of the same type at once. We can't hold an image in mind and use the visual part of our brain at the same time very well. Just like you can't listen to me now and also do maths at the same time. We can't do two verbal things at once or we can't do two very visual imagery based things at once. Okay, now that limitation of the brain, we can get that to help us here. Just give me a second because what we also know, number three, is that we can make, we can update memories, we can change them. And of course we know that as clinicians and therapists. But if we just um, bring a memory to mind briefly, not too distressing, just a little bit, it can set about the right conditions to update that memory. And that's the time we could do this imagery-based task that competes with the trauma image. And by doing that for long enough, we can erode that memory and stop that image from intruding again to mind. Now, I know that hypothesis is going to have sounded complicated perhaps, so I'm going to try and explain it again um, in different ways as we go through. Here we have, for example, a trauma image. We, what we would ask the patient to do is very briefly and gently bring it to mind. They don't have to tell us about their trauma, but to themselves, just to have that image in mind. Maybe they could just use, say, four or five words. We would then teach the patient how to use the visual part of their brain, for example, what we would call uh, mental rotation, how to imagine things changing and moving, um, and spend some time doing that. And then we would get them to do a very, very image-based task. 
for about 20 minutes. The task that we've used in our research is a computer game called Tetris, which is a game where you have colored blocks and shapes that move. And we get them to play that game for 20 minutes after having steps one and step two first. But it doesn't just have to be Tetris in the real world. It could be any other really visually engaging task. And when we talk to therapists, therapists always have very creative ideas, and I'm sure you will too. It could be um, puzzles, it could be knitting, it could be anything else that is super visual, but as it were, engaging that visual part of your brain a lot, and that you can do it for 20 minutes. So the second thing to remember is that you do it once per different intrusive memory of trauma. And what we talked about earlier is that one patient might have two different intrusive memories, another patient might have 10. It's rarely more than 10 or 12, um, but once per different intrusive memory that the patient doesn't want to have. And quite often, if you teach them and do it once, it's quite a simple intervention. It has to be done in the right way, and it has to be done in the right order, and it has to be done for the right time. But if the patient learns that, they can use it themselves. Why is that so important? When a situation of ongoing trauma, if you have a technique which you can use yourself, next time a new trauma occurs, that could be an advantage. So next time you get new intrusive memories, for example, in a war, there's another traumatic event, then the person can use it again. I'm not going to go through these slides in detail because we'll run out of time for our, our conversation that we want to have later but they're just to show you some of the laboratory experiments behind our thinking, where we've spent time trying to work out how to get this technique to work, and then how we first started working with people very soon after trauma, um, waiting in the emergency room of a hospital, using this kind of intervention procedure. And very simply, what these early stage research studies indicate is that if you do this kind of intervention, it reduces the number of intrusive memories you have by approximately half compared to a placebo condition. And we replicated that work in a hospital recently in Sweden and showed that doing the intervention once soon after a trauma uh, helps people even over a month later, they're still having less intrusions than people who did not do the intervention did a placebo task. So that gives us some suggestion, it's not full clinical guidelines evidence, but some suggestion that effects may persist. As clinicians, I'm sure the question you're asking in your minds is what about after the golden hours? What about not just soon after trauma, but later? Well, Sophia will talk about this too, but we've worked with people uh, in, in, in clinical case studies who have complex PTSD and in, were inpatient, so their trauma memories are 20 year old and been able to um, have an early indication that, as you see from the graph, that it helps intrusive memories go down without having to talk about the trauma. And we've also been working in Sweden with people who are refugees, mostly from Syria, um, adapting the technique. So it's something that you can also do uh, even in a public space because it requires um, something that's self-guided. And so to remind ourselves before we finish on the last slides, it's a three-step procedure. You have to do all three steps. It is not just comparing a computer game. You have to, number one, lightly bring the memory to mind, just gently, not so much the patient gets upset and not so little that it's not there, enough that you can see the memory. The person then has to, to do a visual spatial task, which really engages the brain. So using mental rotation or something else to keep very visually active. Here playing Tetris for 20 minutes, whilst imagining all those blocks rotate and using that to play the game. And it can be done once per different trauma memory and ideally teach the patient to be able to use it and give them a tool in their own hands. Um, and this just says the same thing in words, so I won't repeat it. Finally, I wanted to talk about intrusive memories that aren't in our psychiatric textbooks, but I think probably should be. And that is that we know a lot of people are having intrusive memories after media exposure. And we also know from research that the hours spent watching intrusive uh, war-related media exposure 
is associated with very similar symptoms to that we see after um, direct exposure. In DSM-5, the diagnostic book, um, the criteria for trauma include direct or remote exposure, and they only include uh, media pictures and television if it's in the line of work. For example, police person watching media footage. And I wonder whether as a group we ought to challenge this and say, is, in, is war or war related also should be in this exception category? Because if one's in the middle of war trauma and seeing video footage, the brain will have a hard time differentiating with the two. And clearly many people are already reporting um, uh, difficult images, not only of their own direct experiences, but what they see happening to others. What do we do with this clinically? Obviously, the first thing we need to do is see if it's possible to behaviorally limit the amount of exposure to visual or traumatic media, particularly for children and young people, and particularly to our patient groups who are particularly vulnerable to developing intrusive memories of trauma, as I mentioned, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders. Um, and this may be done in simple ways of reducing the time spent viewing or shifting to a non-visual channel like radio for news at times rather than just visual media and avoiding cons uh, media consumption before sleep. But I think also imagery computing task techniques can be very useful if as, um, as a way of processing and calming down a bit after seeing very difficult footage that one's seeing again and again, day after day. So to summarize, our take home messages. Intrusive memories occur across disorders and mental imageries. We've talked now about a simple procedure that could compete with the imagery nature of traumatic memories in a way we don't have to discuss the trauma in detail, but it may help stop it intruding and at least provide relief uh, in the short term. There are three steps, it's not just gameplay. Uh, and perhaps this could also be useful for media exposure that's becoming intrusive and traumatic for people. Um, I, what I stand united with all my colleagues in the Traumatic Stress Network is that we need more preventative and scalable mental health treatments after trauma for those of those, those who have gone to get a risk. And we need to develop strategies and ways of disseminating this digitally as well to support the good work that everyone is doing and trying to help. And I hope that two take home messages might be that simple things can sometimes be powerful for improving mental health, particularly when things are very complicated. So what's the least we can do to make a difference? And how can we work together over the months to come and in the longer term, using these clinical discussions about to find out what is needed and what tools might help um, safely and safe, sensibly to generate improvements to help in the Ukraine, we hope, and others are facing trauma worldwide. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. And I'm very pleased to turn over now to Sophia, who will talk a little bit more about um, one of her cases. Um, um, Sophia, over to you. Um, Let me first introduce Sophia. Uh, because uh, yeah, and uh, just just uh, just a short update that we are, we have several questions uh, in our chat. Uh, most of them are related to uh, the method that you've just presented, mm -hmm. Emily, and uh, request to explain in more details each stage. And uh, yeah. I I assume that Sophia will do that right now. And yeah. if there will be further questions about this so we will go back during q a and uh, is, it, is it okay irina to ask just one question to emily before we bring it over to sophia if i if i yeah, may yeah. if i may before we go emily that was wonderful if i may say so the, the the great overview of your work and also of the topic that is so relevant for all the attendees here just i was a little bit puzzled if i may but you gave the answer, I think, on slide number 45. And the, the puzzle that I was struggling with, if there is an ongoing war, an ongoing superimposition of new intrusive memories, new exposures of material, so to speak, what would be your best advice 
to go with the, let's say the Tetris manipulation or with the behavioral intervention that I felt was on slide number five, 45, limiting the use of viewing trauma-related material, shut down the media exposures, or just your take on that, because that may be highly relevant for the people in Ukraine at this moment. I think we need all of those approaches. So clearly we need the news. So sometimes you need to, you, you won't know when the news is gonna affect you. So we can do some things to manage the news. And I think more for vulnerable patients, just to not minimize, like it can still be affecting you uh, in terms of intrusions, even though you didn't really see it yourself. So to look after people. Um, but if you have developed intrusive memories, then I think the first line is always the simplest to learn they're not real, the metacognitive techniques, because you can use that on all of them. And then the next line is if that's still going on, then to do what Sophia has done in her case, which is to use the three-step imagery interfering thing um, as one possible technique. It's very simple. It only takes 25 minutes per trauma. Um, and therefore, it's something that you could apply when you, new traumas occur. Thank you. We'll be hearing more about that when Sophia speaks. If, if, if there is another question, uh, one, one brief question that somebody says, it tetri is Tetris copyright protected? Can we use Tetris? That I there, saw the there are all sorts of free versions of it out there. You can they have adverts, but you can switch them off. Okay, thank you. If you play it in airplane mode. <laughs> thank you. If you want to introduce Sophia, uh, Irina, then we go to the clinical case. Thank you again, Emily, and we'll entertain more questions as we go on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Sophia uh, actually is a colleague of mine. Uh, so she is uh, a PhD student and uh, teaching assistant at the Department of Medical Psychology, Psychosomatic Medicine and Psychotherapy of Bogomolis National Medical University in Kiev, Ukraine. And right now she's working with Emily on a research project. And uh, yeah, I hope Sophia will share more details like uh, what is the outcome of, of this collaboration. And maybe then, sorry for interrupt again, uh, Irina, but I also was prompted that Oleg Shaban is with us tonight on this on this um, webinar. So we all welcome you, Oleg, to, to be with us here tonight. And we hope to hear your voice uh, after Sophia has uh, given her presentation. Yeah, thank you for waving. Okay, good, good that you're with us. Yeah. Now we turn it to you, Sophia. Um, when you say something, you have to unmute, Oleg, because we didn't hear you. Hello, hello, dear friends. I uh, will share my vision on this uh, afterwards. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be a part of today's uh, Hot Topics meeting. I want to present my clinical case, which uh, I suppose is relevant to the topic of traumatic memory and uh, war trauma. Um, um, you see that patient consent was obtained and of course, personal data has been changed. Um, short introduction. Um, the patient's diagnosis is a, a borderline personality disorder. I won't list all her symptoms. They uh, meet the diagnostic criteria, but I will focus on those that seemed quite specific to me. Uh, first of all, the most distressing symptom was intrusive memories. Um, uh, if we're talking about my patient, there were only intrusions that were fresh about the war, previous intrusion, uh, intrusive memories about childhood violence, for example, uh, did not pop up in her mind. Um, during the last months. Uh, she sat in a basement for a long time and she did not have the opportunity to um, perform self-harm behavior uh, and sleep uh, became a defense mechanism. I think that is why the number of intrusive memories um, is quite large and they are fixed in her memory. And uh, after the outbreak, of the war, her mood shifts focused uh, specifically on guilt. Other emotions were replaced. And uh, by the way, she opposes taking medications, uh, so she prefers psychotherapy. 
Um, she witnessed uh, what was happening in Bucha and um, all of her intrusive memories had a common military scene. Uh, we started work when she was in Bucha and um, finally she managed to leave for a safer place uh, a few weeks ago. And um, um, let's move to a particular intervention. Um, using this case and an, uh, as an example, I want to show how visual special intervention can work. Um, I chose Tetris game to deal with her intrusions. And um, uh, here you can see main reasons. Uh, it is convenient. It can be self-guided and takes approximately 30 minutes uh, or 25 minutes. It's easy in usage. Um, actually, this is a difficult patient who had a high risk of dissociation during um, imagery rescripting or exposure, and she was unable to talk about her experience in detail. And um, um, actually, she's quite young. She works in IT sphere, and uh, we have a high level of uh, mutual understanding. That's why uh, I decided to try this intervention uh, with this patient. Uh, uh, of course, uh, before doing the intervention, I had a meeting uh, with, uh, I had a lot of meetings with Emily and the researchers from Uppsala Emotional Mental Imagery Lab uh, about the procedure. And um, I won't repeat a lot of particular stuff, but um, I will um, point out main steps. Um, you must follow the instructions and do everything in sequence. Um, and it is important that you should keep in mind the particular intrusive memory. Uh, we, we can take one at a time. Um, then we use mental rotation of pieces um, while playing Tetris. Um, it's quite important not just playing Tetris, but uh, to think how you put um, uh, specific figures and um, uh, you're trying to um, think about uh, your actions. And uh, actually you should play Tetris for at least um, uh, 20 minutes. And um, 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 disrupted consolidation of uh, trauma memories uh, um, uh, can be seen after that. Um, here, um, uh, actually, we started uh, on March 25th, and you can see examples of patients' intrusive memories. Uh, total, uh, uh, there were 15 of uh, them in total, and um, this is quite a lot, actually. And all the intrusions uh, you see on this list are from different episodes, but they all have a common military theme. So um, these are the most uh, severe one. Uh, like flying rockets, uh, uh, dead bodies, and stuff like that. And then, um, of course, she got special instructions uh, because by um, borderline personality disorder patients uh, are quite specific in their symptoms. And uh, we agreed that she would intervene once a day at a specific time. Suddenly, she measured her distress level before and after the procedure uh, and uh, entered uh, the data in a table. Uh, now, the number of memories has decreased to five. The level of distress has also decreased. Of course, in parallel, I used uh, trauma-focused um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, to deal with other symptoms. Uh, here you can see patient's feedback. Um, and at the beginning, she was quite critical. Uh, but um, if you pay attention to the last paragraph, she uses a very interesting metaphor. So she compares intrusive memories with a brick wall. So it was quite um, um, unusual for her uh, to use a uh, um, computer game to deal with intrusive memories. And um, she had a feeling actually that her brain is coping with intrusions uh, even without her conscious participation. And um, now she's proceeding with her other intrusive memories. Uh, of course, um, um, one more thing that is quite important that um, um, first uh, um, we agreed that um, I, will, um, I will always be online. I know this uh, particular 30 minutes a day and um, I'm always ready to help her um, if she, she will have uh, some complaints uh, uh, or um, um, severe symptoms or um, very high level of distress. And uh, to sum up, I, I have a few general suggestions which I made uh, during the period of work, uh, during the war. Um, and um, um, 
If you don't know which symptom to start with, um, start with the one that worries your patients the most. It's quite important. And um, we must not forget about the basic things such as sleeping, eating, uh, um, and routine stuff for a patient. And um, it is very important to limit the amount of time uh, spent reading, watching news, especially visual content. content. Um, the level of compliance is uh, of the great importance. Um, and um, uh, I think we should not be conservative because there are a lot of different formats of interaction with the patients. Um, if you, um, your patient should definitely have a first aid kit with techniques uh, that uh, he or she can use uh, as um, um, in emergency uh, techniques, uh, and we should separate it from uh, regular therapy stuff. Um, Evidence-based protocols are good, but uh, not universal, and um, you treat the patient first, uh, not the disease. And sometimes individually tailored combination of techniques uh, is needed. Um, I hope that, uh, that um, um, it's quite okay for you if uh, you're going out of plan, because uh, um, um, in any case, you will have to react according to the uh, situation and also before that uh, you could have had a perfect treatment plan. And um, actually, I think that it's quite important, don't forget about ourselves, because no one needs a, a therapist to cry in front of you, and the effect of therapist's personality plays an important role. And um, 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 in general, I want to point out that um, this is not about replacing traditional therapies with uh, a new digital ones, uh, but the point is that the best option um, is to combine different methods and um, we cannot refuse digital stuff. We should uh, think about how we can implement it in a particular situation. Because um, I'm a CBT therapist as well and um, uh, trauma-focused therapy works due to the protocols, but um, this particular patient was quite distressed um, with the, her uh, intrusive memories, and it was impossible uh, to make um, a lot of um, imagery scripting online. It was uh, quite dangerous, and uh, uh, I do believe this decision can um, represent you that it's possible to use different methods, uh, but um, uh, every case is quite individual. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sofia. Uh, and uh, yeah, we see more questions in Ukrainian and uh, as well as previous one, uh, they are uh, about the technique itself. So uh, like uh, people are asking, so it seems that you have to play Tetris and thinking about uh, intrusive memories at the same time. Mm, Emily? Emily? Emily can comment on that. I think Sophia described it very nicely. You have to think about it at one, two, three. So you, you do think about the intrusion. You need to bring it in your mind. Imagine that your mind's a computer, okay? You just need to put the picture on the screen of the computer briefly. Not so much the patient gets upset, not so much the patient dissociates, but just to bring it and look at that photograph briefly so it's in mind. Then you can let go of the picture again. Then you play the Tetris with the mental rotation. That's number two for 20 minutes, as Sophia described. But you don't have to do both. You don't have to go through. You just have to do it in the right order. Mm -hmm. So Does that makes sense. So the second question is, what is mental rotation? Can you please give an example? Yes. Um, can you see the L of my hand? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. If you shut your eyes and you imagine rotating my hand by 90 degrees, you can see that the L, can you imagine that L rotating when you don't see my hand? Can you shut your eyes and make it go all the way around? Now, if you were buying clothes in the shop and imagining what they look like, or you were trying to park your car, you actually use mental rotation all the time in your, uh, in your mind. But what you use in the Tetris game is it's a very, very good way of using up visual spatial part of your brain, as it were. So you're trying to get someone to take the block like um, Sophia described. So at this block here, ah, if I rotate it there, where will it go? And it's much harder to do it with your eyes shut. 
So you want them to do it mentally, not just swipe with their finger. Sophia, can you do you want to explain it? Does that does that get capture it well? Could you explain it in a in a better way, maybe? Um, I'm not sure I can explain it in a better way. Um, I'm just uh, wanted to point out that you should be involved in a game. Yeah. Um, tennis is not a um, a game you can win in. But um, it's, uh, I mean, like um, your target is not to put a record in Tetris, but um, you should think about how to make the line of different blocks. And if you make uh, a line, so it will disappear and you will get more points. It's very important that you should uh, be involved yeah. in the process of playing Tetris. Maybe thank you for uh, Emily and for Sophia. Now it's, yes, I see that uh, Oleg is waving his fingers. And this is a time to direct the attention to you, Oleg. You, you can speak in Ukrainian and it'll be translated on the fly to English, uh, Oleg. Great to have you with us. You would like to comment on um, on the overall presentations, though you need to unmute. <laughs> okay, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. yeah, let me also try to explain because yeah, I've been using this method and I've been using it with myself. Why? Because uh, like two missiles have hit the center of Kiev uh, while we were talking, and again, more people suffered. So uh, tomorrow I'll be working with my patients, and I understand that their imagery uh, are really very bright, not even 3D, it's 4D, because they have the smell, so they have the 4D imagery, and it's very difficult uh, to compete with this imagery. So the Tetris work helps us achieve success in the special rotation because we are saying that it's uh, addressing a different part of the cortex, but also if in a traumatic experience there's no success and the success is, well, surviving. But in Tetris, when the line disappears, it gives you a short achievement and it is registered. And the reward, uh, well, becomes dominating. So the, this competition word uh, is working. So this short achievement of uh, the line is, is disappearing is better than uh, having no reward that you can't change the situation. And I've been working uh, with uh, rapes, with witnesses of murder and well, the, this imagery is 3D anyway for you, for the therapist. And I also, when I'm in the shelter, in the bomb shelter, I take my gadget and I process the imagery myself. And I know from personal experience that it is working. And I'm 100% confident that it will be in the guidelines uh, one day because it's effective it's, and it's fast and simple. There's there are methods of therapy which are in the standard guidelines. Well, there are only two. This is uh, TFCBT and the uh, eye movement. Um, and they are complicated, uh, but they, they are not always applicable. For example, the most popular uh, method, the reprocessing, it requires prolonged sessions uh, of creating a safe place in the mind of the patient. But well, well, it requires the establishing of confidence with the patient. And I had to change the safe location because it was not competitive. Uh, when there was a group of, uh, of, of therapies, the patients got uh, re-traumatized again. But this thing is very effective. But also, I want to note one more thing. Uh, the nightmare. Uh, component where we cannot uh, uh, easily influence. Like yesterday, I consulted a patient who says that every night she keeps seeing war in details, in minuscule and very bright details. So, of course, I recommended uh, some pharmacological support and uh, specifically prazosin, which is uh, 
now researched uh, for nightmare effect and also we have therapy and i think here we shouldn't even talk about the uh, ptsd guideline and of course uh, eric and Darina and me we were involved in the guideline and its beauty is that it does everything to not have ptsd I mean, yeah, and this, indeed the first, in the first weeks, we have to do something which would be more competitive. It's very difficult. But these micro rewards, like in Tetris, uh, like, uh, for example, when we work with the personality of the patient, uh, the, 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 there are huge resources and the patient might not be even aware of that resource that they won, that uh, they achieved already by coming to, therapy and uh, for example we've uh, also tried uh, when we worked with the patient and the, and i said okay you have lost a house you lost a car but well this is great price for a lesson of survival and life is the most uh, priceless thing so you well paid with um, some scrap metal but you got a lesson in survival so we keep working on rewards and achievements but here i really like that it's very specific simple and effective and uh, i know uh, from my own experience that it is really effective oleg so once again first of all we imagine we have this reactivation of the intrusive memory that's step one so step two this mental rotation is what sophia explained it very well in the history we have to understand what this traumatic experience is for us you remember that the um and that in reprocessing they also invoke the tr a traumatic memory but it's transformed into a symbol and you work not with the image of the loss, but with the symbol. I had a patient who saw the symbol, the Russian flag on the tower in his city, which uh, has not been occupied. So he imposed, he, tra he transformed his uh, war losses in the symbol. And we were working not with the real imagery, but with the symbol he had. So it's different, right? And here, in this case, you work with a very, very specific thing with, uh, with this 4D format. But it is clearly uh, step one, step two, step three. And sometimes the patient uh, can even say that, okay, that thing was most traumatic. They can rank uh, the intrusions um, by severity. But also let me remind one thing, and we have to mention it sometimes, uh, with our good efforts from fragments, we uh, create one big traumatic memory. And then, well, Otto, Otto Kembertke is our friend. So we have to be careful. There's the image, we and we switch something to more uh, a more competitive imagery. And it can be Tetris. It can be another game with uh, some... Uh, visual spatial component and some reward and in this way we work with the first the second the third thing we shouldn't work in general with war no it will not work we have to work with one specific thing and the image of the cat the house burned down uh, so what should be the interval between these different images how can we apply it so you work for 20 minutes and then you can use any spatial geometric figures, not complicated, I emphasize. Nobody emphasizes that. The point is not win the Tetris game because they say nobody can win in a Tetris game. Sorry, but they give you points and they give you scores. Score doesn't matter here. What matters is the disappearance, this childhood euphoria getting back to this childhood sense of achievement. Tetris, you dis it's disappearing and it competes with the traumatic memory. Uh, yeah, you... So Ole has, so you can select Irina, the next image then, Irina, uh, Irina, sorry. Uh, I see we have details. loads of detailed specific questions. 
Well, maybe, maybe we can do the following. Можливо, давайте так вчинимо, Ірино. Якщо ми попросимо Емілі прокоментувати перше питання, а потім вже передати слово учасникам. Коротенький коментар. Дякую за те, що поділилися своїм досвідом про те, як ви саме користувалися цим інструментом, як він може бути корисним. Я багато чого дізналася для себе і чекаю на наступні запитання від учасників. Дуже ми дякуємо, Олеже. Перепрошую, що я перебив вас, Ірино, але були б раді почути ваші голоси учасників. Я бачимо, що є дві Оксани, вони коментували щось в чаті, але, можливо, ви можете і інших запросити виступити. І дякую, що ви зробили ваші коментарі, Олеже, настільки персональними, настільки корисними. Дякуємо дуже вам за роботу. Ірино, можливо, ви будете модераторкою цієї частини дискусії українською мовою. Я думаю, що так буде краще для того, щоб ми почули голоси інших наших учасників. У мене є пропозиція. Тут є дуже конкретні питання щодо техніки. Ми попросимо Софію, щоб вона зі згоди Емілі переклала презентації українською і включила відповіді на ці конкретні питання в цей конспект, яким ми поділимося з учасниками на сторінці нашої асоціації, і я посилання кидала в чат і можу ще раз продублювати. Я думаю, що так буде простіше. І також тут є декілька цікавих питань, наприклад, чи є вікові обмеження щодо застосування тетріс гри, чи якісь рекомендації щодо віку. Я думаю, важливо винаходити методи для дітей. Я не досліджувала питання дітей, але я не думаю, що там має бути щось відрізнятися. Потрібно, звісно, пристосовувати до певної вікової групи фонд дітей війни. Дуже гарно працює, тобто, можливо, Головите, говорити про нав'язливі спогади у дітей, я дуже вас, вам рекомендую знайомитися із роботою цього фонду, із їхніми напрацюваннями. Емілі, дякуємо. Е, Ірино? Що Емілі, чи, чи зможемо ми навести інструкцію для пацієнтів у цьому конспекті, який я пропоную зробити з вашого дозволу? Так, нам варто обговорити, що ми будемо надавати учасникам, що саме. Ну, можливо, це буде така якось рольова гра, щоб ми представили вам, щоб це була не просто інструкція, щоб ви на власні очі побачили. О, я перепрошую, це моя киця. Мівчить, тому що... Інколи варто щось побачити, тобто це краще, ніж просто прочитати перелік кроків. Ви почули Олега, і, можливо, ми просто розіграємо з Іриною, щоб було краще. Ірина, не знаю, як ви краще навчаєтеся. І коли вона працює, і працює гарно. І, але вона звучить просто, але я думаю, що для цього підходу потрібне навчання. І у нас було багато супервізії з Іриною. Тому що легко помилитися, легко зробити цей сигнал, цей стимул занадто сильним, і тоді пацієнт вже впадає в дисоціацію. Тоді, пані, я пропоную, що у нас, у нас тут 200 учасників, навіть більше. P-O-O-L, which is a brief uh, way of assessing responses from the audience. And if you were to be able to use this technique in your daily routines, we could then presumably, next time we would meet, meet see how you're doing by bringing a few of the questions uh, to our group, which is a lot of participants. And uh, Zoom allows us 
to do a poll. So we will entertain this idea to gather ideas. Since we cannot speak with 200 at the same time, but with a poll, we can allow ourselves to be heard by numbers. Would that be an idea, Emily, that you would also try to entertain with us? Okay, but to hear one voice or two voices, uh, may I invite briefly Olena, Olena Jabenko, if you can hear us, just raise your voice and a comment from your end, because I can read your name in English, but just a, a, a brief uh, response. What have you been picking up from this? Thank you very much for these fantastic presentations and comments from Professor Chaban. Thank you, wonderful. And maybe another one, Natalia Felbaba, may I invite you also to briefly raise your voice? Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, that you gave us uh, this technique uh, and uh, I think it's uh, it must be very good and um, I hope that uh, someday I will use it with my clients. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I hope you don't mind if I invite you also, Olena Shakova. Olena, can you hear us if you want to bring a brief comment? Olena Shakova, if you can hear us. Or let me try somebody. I can else. see my colleague, uh, our colleague from uh, from Romania. Uh, yeah, please. Pastin, hi, nice to see you. Um, how is it going in Romania? Do you see patients with intrusions? Yes, um, the, the evening was very interesting. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak as well. Uh, we do have been, um, we do have patients from the Ukraine indeed. So uh, the techniques I've learned tonight uh, were very interesting and I'm looking forward to using them. Thank you. Great. Can you invite uh, somebody else, Irina? Yeah, there was uh, another interesting question. Uh, I don't remember who exactly asked it uh, about dissociative symptoms. So uh, what should we do if if patient is really dissociating, uh, for example, uh, during uh, bringing this uh, picture into his mind before playing Tetris? Emily, your end. We're trying to do all we can to not dissociate. So if you have a very dissociative patient, I guess, what you tried to work with before is giving them all the control they can have to not bring it up. When we worked in the study with inpatients with complex PTSD, we gave them the control to write something down and then to shred it, but to never tell us. And so it just requires slowing down. I think it's really hard if you're working remotely to manage dissociation. So um, that's why we're so careful about picking the right time. And I guess what you would already do in your clinical practice is have a, a plan for dissociation that you've agreed with that patient. So maybe you need to yeah. think about that too. Yeah. Hey, B, it, it is almost a quarter past the hour. Um, just a question to you, Oleg. When you gave your first uh, comment, you said that at the time that we spoke, two assaults were in Kiev heard or felt. Uh, did the translator pick that up correctly? I see several people yeah, now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. During the hour that the seminar was held, uh, Kiev region and the center of Kiev were targeted. And there were news that I seen because we are working during the air raid siren. Uh, there were statements made by the mayor. Uh, the rescue officers are working and helping people at the site. That many people are in, sh are in shelters. And in the context of this conversation, we talked about the technique that can be applied anywhere. This is critical because uh, the connections are disrupted uh, between the patients and the therapists. And this can be a self-guided method. You can just give it to the patient. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing this terrible news with us, but that's the case that we're in. And that's probably also our incentive to bring this information to you in these dark times. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, Irina, uh, I feel that we're about to wrap up, but uh, we, we, we first need to thank uh, Emily and Sophia for bringing this material to us 
and you may be doing so. But before I would like to give the word to you, thank you so much for being here with us. This is really uh, amazing that we have been able to reach out to over 200 attendees. It shows to us that you care to be informed about this material. It gives more incentive for us to keep doing this. We are delighted that we have two translators with us that enable us to bring this material to you in the language that you are able to capture it on the fly. So we will improve our translational capacities and uh, we will be sharing uh, new experts, uh, the next sessions that you will hear from us. So stay tuned with us.